And hi. Hi, everybody. I think we're live, and I think we're showing up on um, the Bay Area Reporter's fourth chat. This time, we're going to talk about porn and oh, sex and escorts. And yeah, I'm seeing it on our Facebook page, so hopefully you are too, and you'll see it on our YouTube page soon enough. I'm Jim Provenzano, arts and nightlife editor of the Bay Area Reporter, and with me is the illuminating veteran writers, John Carr and Cornelius Washington. Um, I don't, I forgot, I was gonna print out your long, your bios, and I did not do that. I was too busy looking for hot pictures of naked men. Oh. I, <laughs> so basically what we wanna discuss is the context of how the Bay Area Reporter covered sexuality that is from its very earliest days as 1971 um, gay porn was becoming very popular there were some hits like boys in the sand some feature length that that expanded beyond the loops that you can you know watch and hear about this history and in, in the deuce that lovely mini series or series um, but John tell me let's start with you when did you start writing for the Bay Area reporter oh um, I want to say 78. Okay. Could have been a year or two earlier. And how were things by that? Had you read the paper beforehand? Were you in oh, the Bay yes. Area? And what was your opinion about the paper and it's dealing with erotica and porn? It hasn't changed. And the paper wasn't too fancy back then, but I took great umbrage when I was standing around Toad Hall and other popular watering spots to hear people saying, oh, that that bar is such a rag. They were always ragging. They never would call it the Bay Area Reporter. It was always the bar. It's a hate. And it was a rag. <laughs> but it was, it was basically one of the best bar rags around at the it, time, wasn't it? it? It was not a rag. <laughs> it just happened to be giving, they were giving up out for free in places where gay people could find it. It was but a newspaper. It was, it was a free a newspaper. newspaper. Yeah. A well, newspaper's a rag. And and uh, I don't know if people know, but you can look at almost all of the uh, vintage issues of the BAR, which are very yellowed, but um, are PDF viewable and downloadable on archive.org. We'll uh, share a link on the Facebook invite and as well as on our YouTube channel once this is done. But what I find fascinating now, Cornelius, tell me where you were in the mid seventies. You were in New York. I was in New Orleans. Okay. I was born and raised there, but I'd always heard of the BAR. Really? You know, and it's being the first uh, gay newspaper, you know. And it one was. Of the I'm sorry. Well, it's actually one of the first. The Philadelphia Gay News stopped publication for a while, so we have a friendly rivalry with them that they started before us, but then they quit for a while and came back. So okay. we're the longest continuously published. Consistent, yes. consistent. And um, I always knew that it was legendary. I mean, it represented the San Francisco culture and I always loved it. I always heard about it, I always loved it. What image fascinates me, I'm gonna start at the beginning and share my screen. There's a, everyone be patient, there's a moment of, of uh, the screen illumination window. This is a compilation of stuff from the 70s and night and 2000s that uh, kind of stuck out. There were a lot of ads in the mid 70s, but in the early 70s, there was a strange combination of politics and porn. Sometimes on the cover, the publishers wisely used a handsome man, a picture on the cover that led to a later article but the real cover story was obviously about politics or crime or discrimination. Can you go back a page? Yeah. Notice how here we have porn corner. Here we have carnal. Oh, I'm touching my screen. On the color, <laughs> picture, on the color, yeah, on the color <laughs> picture at the up. bottom, that's right. carnal. My cursor? Yeah, porn corner. And in a black and white thing. Immediately to the left of sex pack advertisement, there's another porn review that's labeled Porn Corner. Yeah. We're going to talk about that. Okay, because, yeah, it, it changes over the years a few times. And this is one of your later reviews of, uh, uh, what is it? And Porn Corner had to be one of the early. And Shonda ran an interview. Now, Cornelius, for those who don't know who are watching, uh, Cornelius later was it 2016 i think started doing interviews with performers at the knob hill theater which obviously over the years advertised plenty 
and kept the paper thriving with large ads almost every week from the very yes. early days. Yes. A joy. It was a joy to do. A, a thrill. Yeah. To, I wish I'd gone more often. And what we're also going to discuss are the, are the notorious escort ads that featured and rose to multiple prominence and multiple pages over, at certain peak moments before being murdered by Craigslist and other services. Okay, so this is a very early BAR with Casey Donovan. John, would you uh, agree that he was the first great gay porn star? First. Probably if close to it, if not it. Okay. And it was Boys in the Sand that Wakefield Pool really brought porn, gay porn into the kind of, not the mainstream, but into legitimacy? Well, I would really, I would say mainstream. But yes, I would too. Perhaps legitimacy. It was reviewed. The movie was reviewed in Variety because right. it was running so long at the same theater in New York. Uh, so yeah, he opened the door. And that was the era where, like Deep Throat, celebrities would go for the cachet, the chicness of going to see porn. Right? In the Porno theater. chic. Porno chic was the term. Porn. Like Andy Warhol and Bianca Jagger would be seen going in. I, re I remember seeing these in People magazine going, what is going on in New York City? I'm going to go back and find out. So um, This is also another feature, a big ad, a full page ad for the idol. Not one of my favorites, but I appreciate it for its provenance. I, I think there's another full page idol ad where they quoted my review in full. Oh, okay. Now, this is another example of politics and porn blending in, a, well, actually, it's nude theater. There's <laughs> Michael Kearns. Michael Kearns, who has a new book out. And Jack Wrangler, another classic epic porn. Now, this this is one of my favorite logos, too, the curly BAR logo. That yeah. is very cute. Uh, we keep meaning to put those on new coffee mugs. I like that. I, I, like I, I don't know how long I can keep this showing, but Grant, Gordon Grant was one of my absolute favorites of the uh. old porn days. He's also, this is featured in Bob's Bazaar, which became Marcus's leather column, but was basically, as you can see, just a, a bazaar of all kinds of wacky things. Well, it was the it was the back section where you put anything that was sexual. Ah, So okay. people who didn't want to see, we had complaints. Right. I don't want to see that. The Opera House, I don't want my ad next to an ad for a dirty movie. Right. So all that stuff was in, it was Bob's Bazaar when I got there. Yeah, okay. And that was 78. It was like it looked like that. Now, this is 1978. There's a combination of ads and reviews in Bob's Bazaar that the Spartan. Did you ever ever attend that theater, John? Yes. How was it? How was it? On Mason Street. 150 Mason. I have no recall. <laughs> well, it, it, I love the I love the graphics. I love the fonts. I love the way it loops around. And Brentwood presents Sex Pack. I can't remember if I've seen that one. I have. Really? I love no, the Brentwood no. series. Um, sure. I love the Deco Knob Hill Cinema font. You can barely recognize it, but you know what it is. It's it's very uh, classy. So your review uh, here, John, is one to see and one to skip. Sex Pack, which is advertised on the adjoining page. I think you liked it, but there was another one that you didn't care for. So these were a collection of loops, like yeah. single scenes that were thrown together to make a feature. Yes, um, from a company that was the a progenitor of Falcon. Oh, okay. Actually, okay. Let's see. Here's some more. I think I passed the censors. There, there, there is a little bit of penis in there. Oh, sh but sh even even if you blow the picture up full size, it's hard to see. <laughs> Hard to see. So Cinematachine, that was another, like a, a club for watching movies? That was Hal Call's movie theater. Can you yes. can share a bit of his history, who he was? Hal Call was one of the founders of the Mattachine Society. Okay. And at a certain step of the way, they kicked him out. <laughs> and he, he came to San Francisco, where he was very active in political and social welfare circles. Um, the Cinematic Sheen was also a social center where homeless teenagers and runaways and anybody else could gather and not be kicked out for loitering immediately. Oh, okay. I see. Um, it's also where he um, 
inveigled these young street boys into having their films taken, jacking off. He had a he had thousands of movies he'd made, eight eight millimeter, three inch reels. Yeah, I almost screen capped the feature. I was scrolling through PDFs to get some more images just a while ago, and I saw the feature article of him with a wall of videotapes in yeah. his home that were donated, hopefully, to I think the One Institute or the or uh, I'm not sure if the Historical Society in San Francisco took them, but he was quite the porn collector. He was quite the porn creator, although terrifically amateur. Oh. Well, you know, that's a genre, too, that you covered. Uh, this, what's fascinating is that in these days, and I remember having a college friend show me movies in 1979 that were those 200-foot reels of, like, you know, a five-minute, a ten-minute movie. And this was pretty much, uh, other than, like, the nerds who had Betamax, this was pretty much the only way you could <laughs> see porn was to go to the theater or to buy in the back of a magazine. You buy a, a film loop and buy a projector, right? Yeah. The Jaguar, and you would buy it here. No, they didn't sell films, I, I don't imagine. I like the creativity of these ads. The Jaguar yeah, was a longstanding advertiser. Um, I don't know which one of them is still awake. And this is the era where, for some reason, they were pink pages. John, can you comment on that? No, I, I can't. <laughs> other, other to say that I had nothing to do with it, because had I been there in an editorial capacity, I would have voiced a complaint. Yes, he would have uh, I, I guess Bob Ross liked tinted pages. Well, I'm trying to remember if this was when The Advocate also had its pink pages. When it, was uh, large, it was a large format out of L.A. And they, they did what many others did, is they pulled the sexual stuff and the escort ads and the personal ads yes. into the dropout section that was literally pink pages. That's a likely explanation. And they maybe they tried to mimic it. So what's interesting here is that Falconhead, another you know, trippy, hallucinogenic porn classic, is advertised next to, on the right, Joe Gage's El Paso Wrecking Corps, his yeah. early trilogy of working class realism verite style. Um, Truck which, stop porn. Yeah. Truck stop gay porn. Well, it, it was just it was the first. Notable, and I, and I recently watched the film about these films. There was a documentary that showed that this was the first time where deliberately masculine men were portrayed in a you know working class realistic way, etc. And not only they were, hmm. I lost the thought. Sorry, gone. Well, I mean, there have been sailors and truckers before, but it seemed like a feature length film that they most they most decidedly weren't loops. Yes, it was that, a yes. Film. that was the, the point. Yes. It was a narrative. They were pr frequently that, and uh, Pacific Coast Highway, et cetera, were literal road trips, road yes. trip films. Yes. Um, and there was an age dynamic, because um, what the subtext to the films were, I just read an interview that he did to Butt Magazine like four or five years back. Mm -hmm. Subtext is usually gay men are introduced to gay sex by someone working class and older. I vote for that. <laughs> yeah, and so that, that was the subtext of it, that you're going to, you know, if you notice in the films, it's the young hitchhiker or the young new trucker learning the ropes from the older guys, and they get to this truck stop to have a bite to eat, and in the restroom is a little action, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and they might be gay, they might be straight, but they're demonstrating gay sex. Right, it was men who having sex with men. It wasn't gay, rainbow flag kind of gay. And, there were, and, go ahead. and it was like a, it was also a critique against disco culture. He literally said oh. that. Oh, that, really? that okay. As far as gay culture was concerned, it was disco. And huh. I laughed at that because that's kind of homophobic, you know? And so that was a reaction to everybody wearing Pia Cardin three-piece suits at Studio 54 you know, here's the situation where the real thing was going on and it was from a masculine. It was going on at the truck stop instead of you at 54 with Bianca Jagger, you know, right. doing the bump of the hustle. But at the same time, Fred Devereaux, is that how he, he was doing urban, Devereaux. urban stories were being told too. They were, they were, you know, at night at the Adonis, there was the one performance that took place at the Gaiety. There was still urban 
stylized stuff with his there, so, there was a real split between east and west coast pornographers yes um, yes uh, other than higgins other than bill higgins who was making you know pacific coast highway pretty boy um in new york things were grittier just as new york is a grittier city right mm -hmm. urban yes so well, I, re I remember some there was some there was some ones that had they had effeminate characters or they had um, they had elder gays who were having parties and then then they would move off and there would be the sex between the two twinks but they, there was a variety i just would just say uh that thankfully didn't you know just get stuck in one up oh, here here's a lovely review you start off mentioning Carson McCullers, the member of the wedding. I tried to be, make as many cultural references as possible. Part, there, there was a reasoning behind that. One of the reasons Paul hired me and was interested that I could write, I wanted to write a porn review, was he wanted to help legitimize the field so people right. would stop trashing porn. Right. It, was, it was, this is a real film performers, camera, you know, um, and it should be greeted that way. And therefore it deserves a real review. Uh, the BAR was running press releases from the companies that made these things. The hottest movie you'll ever see, 800 gushing orgasms, you know, that, that was a review in those days. It was just, just a press release, uh, which the BAR ran to fill up space and to get a picture of a cute boy in. And I came along and started writing what I hoped was a real review, but I like to it was a real review. references. If I'd been at the opera the night before, you might read about a little bit about the opera. Yeah. Context. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And the wonderful thing I love about your writing, John, is if you are passionate about knowing the construction of film, your column explained it. And it explained it on every level, the cinematography, the music, the editing, the lighting. You gave the whole spectrum of the construction. And that's what I always loved about your work. Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I, you can read the center column, the third, fourth paragraph. I've always wondered how K Higgins, as you mentioned before, William Higgins, fits this camera into some of the places it probes. And I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I mean, you're talking about cin cinematography as well as jiggling testicles, which I, I think is a... <laughs> and these were the days before video cameras that you could hold in hand. These were... Mm. Mm. Well, that's what's fascinating, too, is that having shot non-porn movies as a, as a youth, when we would get a, a roll of Super 8 film, you knew you only had three minutes. So if we were doing an animated King Kong feature, we had to time every click every second to know, or else we'd have to do two reels and edit it together later. So yeah. Yeah, the, the, the fragility of using film when you have no budget, it was pretty fascinating. I, mean, I find that fascinating. And here's, our, here's a combination of, uh, the, talk about, we have to talk about when Erect penises stop being published in the newspaper images of because this is 1987 and I thought it was done by that time, but apparently it wasn't, as you'll notice. Right next to a review of a film with Christopher Atkins in some um, The Blue Lagoon? No, I think it was the stripper movie. I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't screen cap it high resolution enough to One read Night it. in Heaven, I believe. Oh, a classic. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this is a lot of jump pages. It's not, I just thought it was, and here's another penis that was actually seen in a poster all over the country, thanks to the, uh, different AIDS organizations, but it's pretty well known. Uh, it's confusing as to who the actual provenance of the, of the owner of the penis is, but, um, that wasn't the, that wasn't the idea. No, it was, but I, I remember someone showed who it was later. Yes. Uh, we're not showing that, but, but it went around everywhere. And this was like long after genitalia was stopped being shown in images even though you can see on the left the escort ads and masseuse ads started to go up around the time of aids people were looking for alternatives for a pleasure i would say anyway one of the high points of the sfa foundation was showing that sharing that poster so here we have now in the back of the of the book as they call it the sports column generally got shuffled along next to the escort ads so physique and Shirtless men and women in, in bathing suits, they're just kind of mixed together in the back of the uh, first. It really section. should have been in the main section, the, the, the main body of the section. Yeah. By, well, you mean the news section. By the time I started. No, no, the, the, the arts and entertainment section, but okay. not in Bob's Bazaar. 
Right, right. A little confusing through the 80s. Um, the, the sports section went to the back of the news section by the time I started writing my sports column. And, I, and this ad, I love. Oh my God. I mean, it's just 37 different fonts. It just explodes with... <laughs> Texture, <laughs> extra. It's got a lot of extra. Yeah, yeah. Whipped cream wrestling. Can't can't say I would have wanted to witness that. Although maybe twelve boy dancer. Just just it's just so exciting. It really. What year, what year was this? This is June twenty third, nineteen eighty eight. That makes 88. sense. That makes and sense. They're already saying it's their twentieth anniversary. Nob Hill's been around since yes. nineteen sixty eight. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yes, because when I when I came to San Francisco, it was there, and that was 1968 and a half. Wow. Okay. Did you go there? Oh, <laughs> that was the first thing I did. <laughs> I had read I had read John Retchie's City of Night, of which course. several seasons previous had caused quite a storm. Yeah. And uh, among other things, it is it's a map to gay life in San Francisco at the time. And it New told Orleans. You, it and told New Orleans. you where the uh, hustlers congregated on Market Street, oh. Florsheim Shoe Store. <laughs> and it <laughs> told you uh, what parks, because his his protagonist went to all these places. Right. So yeah, so I knew about the Nob Hill. I knew about the Strand Theater and I went right up to the balcony. Wow, okay. Now, there was no Spartacus guide or, or, or at the time, there were there other guides other than fictional ones that are neo fiction that Reshi did, there weren't. Um, there was I, thought there, I thought there was the Bob Damon guide at that time, but Damron, the Damron guide, maybe. Damron, yeah. Okay. We're still in 1988. This is the expanding escort ads. This is only two of four pages in that issue. Of you couldn't get away with that, but even with a star. <laughs> These days, these days, you couldn't get away with that. I think the guy on the second page in the upper left under Silver Fox, just above Silver Fox, he advertised for like 20 years and he never changed his photo. Mm -hmm. He's still around. <laughs> Good for him. Yes. Aussie lifeguard. Who wasn't one an Aussie lifeguard? Goodness. that's Now, this is an odd – Will Snyder wrote this. Can, can you remember anything about this feature article, John? Oh, well, I have a feeling that he wanted to meet Leo Ford, who was living in San Francisco with a pornographer really? by the name of, yeah, that's his name. Okay. Well, what was his so name? I can't remember. He put out many, many magazines were published of his movies. It would be easy to find out if I went to the other room and looked at them, you know. Uh, that's or maybe it'll come to me. Okay. He, he made a star out of Leo Ford, who you see there, uh -huh. um, and shot all over San Francisco. And I guess our lovely, um, I think Will was the editor at that time. Okay. Wanted to meet him. And so he did. Well, this is the 1988 Pride issue with the graphics on the upper left. Tell 88. us. 88. Will was the, in 88... Will was the, the sports writer. Okay. And the powerhouse was a mere three years old. <sighs> and now we're in 89. And uh, I did not contact, I did not scan a lot of, you can look at our AIDS panel from last month to see a lot of the coverage that was really pretty fascinating. Um, but what we're not seeing is the juxtaposition of this expanded sexual commerce that really grew uh, in terms of advertising dollars, as well as obviously editorial or advertising space in the newspaper. Can you talk a little bit about, or did you talk to Bob Ross about this acceptance of sex work that other publications except the aforementioned advocate pretty much spurned, um, no pun intended. Um, why do you think Bob was so sex positive? Uh, he hired a lot of the masseurs <laughs> and also thought of the paper as a progressive place, he allowed um, the arts editor, actually Paul Lorch, this guy was editor of the entire paper, um, news as well as the entertainment section. And this would have been among his purview to insist that sex workers 
are, are legit. Mm -hmm. it's and to, and to, and to an ahead. extent, that makes sense. I also know that um, a lot of people wouldn't advertise if you had sex work. It was a very daring, you know, editorial decision. And so I just thought it was extremely brave and extremely romantic for me looking at it, you know, because uh, in fashion, I know that a lot of the fashion people by 88 were blowing up Calvin Klein, Ralph Lauren, yeah. et cetera. And uh, they were using those, those escort boys too, Leo Ford in particular. He was very uh, go, go ahead. He was very popular for oh, many yeah, yeah. years. He was a doll. He looked like he was a doll, a little blonde yeah. doll. And so was, um, that was the, the running subtext. Still is actually. What, what what I think is a fascinating juxtaposition is the presumption of the paper being later on politically moderate or conservative compared to you know full on leftist magazines like Outweek, where I worked in New York, that. This, this, you know, four pages of sex ads for for escorts, and yet they're considered. It was considered a conservative gay newspaper, which I find absurd. That's that's part of the reason they were at the back. Um, <laughs> Bob Bob got in a lot of. Bob had political goals. He wanted. He really wanted to be a supervisor. Oh, right. And he and he worked hard at that. But professionally, he had been a chef at a very popular restaurant and many of his close friends, the other people in the eating business, bar, uh, the bar owners mm -hmm. and the restaurant owners he knew were vehement to him about getting rid of all this sex. They were scandalized, but wow. they came out of the 1950s and right. you could expect that. Yeah, that was their. So I give a lot of credit to Bob, although it was Paul Lurch who really did it. Oh, okay. But Bob he, really loved when the hustlers came in to place their ads. Oh, boy. Oh, we gotta, are we going there? We got to go there. Okay. Yes. So, <laughs> so let me explain and you can extrapolate. So Monday noon was the deadline for these massage and escort ads. So I worked at the paper from 1992 to 94 and then came back in uh, 96 as a freelancer. So I missed it. But Dozens of escorts, some of them big, hulking, muscular guys, would come in with like crumpled bills from go go dancing or whatever by Monday at noon. And everyone upstairs in the editorial offices would just suddenly have to go get another cup of coffee yeah. and peek out from the, the barricade and look and see who was which whores had washed up on shore. That's my recollection. Go ahead, guys. <laughs> I think we veered to Cornelius, but he's left. Oh, okay. I knew I I knew I knew a sizable number of the uh, I'm I'll be say, back. Of, of the hustlers. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay, I knew a, a goodly number of the hustlers who were called masseurs. Yeah. But um, I I have never to my well, I have never paid for sex in my life. So I just <laughs> I like to pal around with the demi monde. Yeah, for some reason in the '90s, I befriended dozens of porn actors. There was a, there were a few parties that I got to, and it was like Aiden Shaw and many others of the, of the, as you call the Raging Hot Falcon Studios. Uh -huh. I just ended up hanging out with them and interviewing them and doing things and talking and hanging out in a non-sexual situation, and it really changed my views and perspectives about them. Yeah, uh, it was that happened to me too. Um, I worked with a lot of them as a dancer. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a professional dancer for many years in music videos and commercials. And I was seeing all these big, hot, hunky guys making money as a go-go boy, go-go so, boys. So yes. I decided to do it. And that's how I met them. And then one of them recommended that I start writing for Unzipped. I had already had a column in a couple of gay magazines. And so I made the political editorial decision to go into erotica. And that's how I became friends with a lot of them. And then my work with the Nob Hill Theater just continued that. Okay, Let me, I'm gonna just talk for a while before I go back to the sexy pictures. So that that that's something too that was fun, um, a little reminiscence that my fascination for go-go dancers is that I, believe it or not, 30 years ago and 30 pounds lighter, I did that a few times. I've had a friend who I used to costume, uh, Jake Corbin. He wanted body painting at a Fire Island benefit once with Robin Bird as the MC. We love her. 
Bang Your Box and the Robin Bird Show. So our connection through like act AIDS activism, ACT UP, and go-go dancing led to porn because these hustlers were always happy and willing to dance and strip for money and raise funds. And Jake was one of them. And I would paint him different colors. Once was uh, red, white, and blue glitter for Fourth of July on Fire Island. Another was he wanted to be the Metropolis robot for um, some I, for some reason. So I did that. But um, he was adorable. Did you because, do a Keith Haring uh, homage? Yeah. Too? For the, for, now this is legendary for the Grace Jones benefit at the Palladium, honoring Keith Haring with you know the Palladium had that huge mural of Keith on the back wall. Grace was of course four hours late, um, but. Jake was decorated with black Keith Haring paint and Blaine Mosley, who was an African-American in Act Up, he was painted with white, like Grace in that vampire movie she was in. So those two, and there's no photos. I've never, I beg people in the Act Up group, like, where are the pictures? Because it's like the 30th anniversary of that event last week. Tom Keene, one of the alumni, shared the poster, which is great. But where, you know, who was this? Why weren't people taking photos of this amazing night? Anyway, who cares? It's all history. So what I wanted to um, touch on, I'm going to go back to the slideshow, is the transition when there were still escort ads. Let me share the screen again. Can you see just the, can you see the ads now? You're not seeing oh, the gorgeous. infinity. They're gorgeous. That, this transition to phone sex, where actual sex, due to the AIDS pandemic, even into the 90s, we still had about four pages of, of phone sex ads along with regular escort ads, um, I just wondered, I thought it was fascinating because we also had the bar talk personal ads that I had for a few years had to edit. How did your coverage of porn shift during AIDS, John? Well, I certainly had to pay more attention to safe sex. It got mentioned a lot and I gave some I gave it some publicity but I was not going to use my platform to proselytize so I kind of just went on reviewing movies as if it wasn't an an age of an epidemic hmm. um, so I didn't there, change too much was there a period where you just started mentioning that men were using condoms? Yes, Al, you, yes, actually I did. Um, I tried to be instrumental in persuading gay men to wear condoms. I felt strongly on the issue. Um, and I would rag the studios, um, I won't mention any names, but Falcon, who, <laughs> who, were, who were among the last porn producers to put condoms on their performers. Right, right, uh, yeah. Chuck Holmes didn't believe that anybody would watch condom porn. Wow. Uh, so yeah, they and were the tax meaning that he would lose money. Yes. And the stop tax of money. Yes. Oh. Huh. Yeah, I remember they were they were late in, in in applying that, and then but then there was also kind of smaller studios of those that were specifically visualizing them, like showing how to put one on, et cetera, oh kind of instructional God. angle that some of them took, um, bending over know. backwards <laughs> or forwards. Yeah. Chris Duffy, look at look on the lower left. Chris Duffy is he is he still alive? He was huge. He, he was sure one of those was. guys who would come in and in the office, in the front office, and just take over the whole little lobby. He was so enormous. He made some movies. Yep. He made quite a few, yes. Yep. Loved him. Yeah, and then here we are, we're moving on to 2000. And John, you got to be on the cover of the Arts and Entertainment. Look what's growing out of Tristan Paris's armpit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember him, his oeuvre, um, and I didn't get to read the text before scanning it. What was the interview about? He had gotten very popular, and I wanted to meet him. Okay. When there's an interview in the paper, it's basically me wanting to meet somebody. Yeah. Oh, sure. um, I was fascinated with who becomes a porn star, what is their background. I found that uh, many of them had perf legit performing backgrounds. I can't remember this guy's name. He was one of my favorites. Um, he had been a Shakespearean actor. 
Come on. Um, with a master's thesis on Shakespeare, you know. So all sorts of people were involved in porn. Still are. Although not, not too many were of the intellectual level. Um, Tristan Paris had been a ice skater, a figure skater. Oh, okay. I commented on that because he just had fantastic buns. I said it was all that skating backwards. All right, works the glutes. I would yeah. love to see Shakespearean porn. That yeah. would be fantastic. So he was he was a very popular performer with a somewhat short-lived career. I don't know where he went. Um, but yeah. And this is, I'm diverting into 2001 with one of my sports columns that what kind of politely I called Sporn, where I would comment on the eroticism of athletics. And what really stuck out for me was this box of a video game. I forget what it was, Serial or something with Jeff Gordon in a silver outfit. And the bulge was clearly Photoshopped to make it look like a lot more than he had. Oh, so you think? But you think? Um, but anyway, that's just a little self-flagellation. And, and around and in 2010, oh, we started the, the porn reviews and the sexual content again, like the like we did with Hunt Magazine and and Out Week in New York in the 90s, like the Advocate did with Advocate Men and their pink pages before that. We decided to move the nightlife stuff into an own little mini magazine, Bartab, oh. which actually started in 2010 and was a monthly. I soon realized that covering nightlife on a monthly basis was difficult, except for those who were organized enough to prepare their nightlife events a month in advance, which is limited to very few nightlife producers. However, one of the favorite things that I took pleasure in doing was visualizing go-go dancers. And I'm going to have to move abruptly on away from that photo. I think. Wait, wait, I was wait, looking. Wait. This is wonderful. Joshua J presents. It was a, 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 a particularly it's almost night dream. This, this was published in the papers, so in that issue, the January 2011. You can look for it on eBay. But what I loved about doing the paper was I got to know photographers like George Lester, who shot this cover, and also I forget the photographer who shot this, but he should be given an award for – because that, that event progressed on to more carnal level that could not be published, but uh, there's evidence. But I got to visualize sexuality in a fun way, and that's something that I'm trying to – you know, I think we, we share this vision of trying to share sexuality in an uplifting way when it is deserved and can how we do that. Can you scan a little bit further down the page so we can see that black and white photo? No, I just did a half of the upper half. Sorry. Because you know who that is. That's, who of is course, it? Debbie Reynolds. Yes. Debbie I, Reynolds and Bob Fosse. Who you're comparing in a porn review with, with Seth Tre Seth with Tres Broadway. Well, Seth Santoro. He changed his name later on. And Billy Santoro, yeah. Uh, I wonder why. Oh, well, there, that's a whole story we don't need to go into, but he yes. turned out to be a bit abusive. But yeah, I loved how you, and I got to edit this and format it, how you contextualized Debbie Reynolds and Bob Fosse in a porn review. That's, again, another show of, of, of clear cleverness and genius. And your right. column, of course, by this time was called Carnal. No, it wasn't. That's That happened that week. I didn't know. To look further down at the pictograph, Says oh, yeah. knowledge. The icon? Yeah. But yeah. Did, did you think that up or did our former arts editor, Roberto, oh, find knowledge? Yeah. Uh, it was Roberto who made those little pictographs. What no, Adrian made the pictographs, but Roberto Friedman thought them up, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, every, every writer got one for his column. Right. Uh, and the name Adriana, of my column didn't change. Okay. Because Adriana, uh, the, D, the famous mashup DJ, created them and Kurt and Kurt uh, Thomas and um, Scott also furthered them in the same genre, but they pretty much, Adriana wrote the template. And this is what I love, I can't really zoom in, but you just see there's a plethora of, of uh, stuff from the January 2017 Carnal Knowledge column. Lots of butts, we try to get as many butts in as possible. I, yeah, I remember, look at the two guys semi-hugging each other <laughs> in the very middle of the page. Yes, yes. Since I couldn't show the goods, right? this was a scandalous photo because the goods were touching. <gasps> if you had any sort of imagination, that's the sort of picture I grew up on, the 50s porn. Oh, of course. Uh, you know, it, you were, if you weren't wearing a posing strap, right? they couldn't show the dick. So yeah. this, this was, oh, that's a mind-blowing photograph. 
if you know that context. I'm in, I'm into Ace Era in the Union suit. I, I have a particular interest in that <laughs> that subgenre of holiday fetish. Anyone yes. with a Santa hat is suddenly sexier. And here's another later interview with Cornelius. I forget, I couldn't find your first column, but this is an early one, Cornelius, with Seth Santoro, who, has, who was performing, obviously, at the Knob Hill Theater. Met him and his husband, photographed them. They seemed very much in love at the time. Cornelius, you are the only porno reviewer I've ever read who takes in a social context and actually asks porn performers about things outside of porn and and expects answers that that many people wouldn't think a porn star was capable of formulizing well what yeah. I, the subtext of that is because of you and your work and people of your generation the thing that we haven't discussed so far in this whole interview is the sexual revolution uh -huh. and the way it was presented to me of my generation and I still carry that to this day, that it was normal and healthy. Everybody was doing it. And there was kind of a porno chic. It was a part of lifestyle. So how I always saw it and continue to see it is from one end, it's lifestyle. And the other end, it's a performance aspect. And so I blend the two. And, you know, porn performers, dancers, models, you know, we all go to the gym. We're all trying to look a certain way. We're all trying to present ourselves. We're all trying to perform and project. And um, I understand them. I understand them. And I only ask questions that I would want people to ask me. I think one of your smartest your smartest interviewees was Mike Gate. Who's oh, somebody's calling. How dare you call my phone while I'm doing a chat? Um, <laughs> Mike, Mike Gate, he's in San Jose. He's on, he says porn. He does OnlyFans. He does all this stuff. But he had like a doctorate in microbiology or something. I mean, the guy's brilliant. And, and he just escorts a lot of them like, like crazy. And Curtis Wolf, whom actually I interviewed, I couldn't find the copy, but- He, he escorts copy. what, you were saying? Sorry? He escorts what? You interrupted yourself. He this escorts one. frequently. He's always on Twitter oh. showing off his latest conquests that mm -hmm. people, people pay him and then he documents them if they want to be. Anyway. Anyway, he was smart, and I met him once, and he was smart. And the same thing with Curtis Wolf. It's like there were a few that were like obviously not the brightest, you know, fish in the barrel or whatever malapropism you prefer, but there were some that were just really fascinating, like Seth Santoro and others. This one that we showed was actually from Leather Week. It, I, I was trying to find the leather porn classic that you wrote up john i think in the 2000s where there's a guy suspended and he's in rubber it was like total fetish overload i couldn't i can't find it still that it's might have been the week of the door alley fair which was yes yes considered a fetish we, we timed those with the leather things i'm going to go into comments because there's some wonderful people that are with us hi Stephen cantrell and you are oh my let me read his comment it's lovely uh, i can show this it's too funny show Oh my God, I'm older than I thought. I remember all these voices. Wait, Paul, Paul Lorch seems to have responded, but he's dead. No, no. Um, Danny Nicoletta. Hi, Danny. Lovely Danny Nicoletta. Share your, your photos. Oh, he's, I love Dan Nicoletta. He was asking I which Paul. Dan. And well, I replied, Paul Lorch. Did of you read the book on Sylvester that your photographs are in? Because when I met Dan Nicoletta, uh, the book on Sylvester, the fabulous Sylvester, Dan has images in the book. And when I was introduced to Dan, I asked him about the book. He said he had never read the book. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he didn't get paid either, damn it. Huh? He didn't get paid for the use of the book. Oh, photos? that I didn't ask about. But you mean the biography of him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a gentleman that did a, a biography on Sylvester. It's called The Fabulous Sylvester. Yeah, I have that and, book, uh, yeah. Yeah, and Dan Nicoletta contributed some photographs. I don't know if he got paid or not but he contributed some photographs. And so when I met him, I've always loved his work, of course. When I met him, I got to hug him and kiss him and ask him, did he love the a book? He said he hadn't read it. And like three people caught him a look like we all want to kill it. And so uh, <laughs> he was very embarrassed about admitting okay. that he had so Jim, what, does, what, does this, what does this mean over in the comments section when Paul Lorch's name appears? Someone was asking which Paul we mentioned, and I, Paul Lorch. Right. Well, the Paul, Paul in that very. Paul Lorch is dead. Don't worry. Calm down. 
Okay, that's, it's, that seems to be Mike Yamashita. No, it's just Michael's face as the uh, the YouTube the YouTube identity of the Bay Area Reporter. When we were God, this, in order to get a hundred followers and to get your own unique Earl that says Bay Area Reporter, you have to have fulfill certain things. You have to get a hundred subscribers. You have to be online for three months, and then we kept doing that. And they said, "No, you can't get your own Earl yet," you, meaning your web address. And it was like, why? It's like you need a face profile. So we just threw up Michael Yamashita's face. <laughs> hey, let, me throw the, let me throw this out right quick. Dan, no, I need you to photograph me later for social media. Would you photograph me, please? And I have I a question you. for I love Dan. your work. <laughs> this is out of control. I have I a question it. for Dan. Wait, he says in the commentary section, um, he only read the first chapter of the Sylvester book, but he has a valid excuse. Well, what? what you can't drop... What was the excuse? He got paid. He got paid. He said he got paid. He said he got paid. Yeah. I can show the chat. Uh, you mean I don't you don't have, have to? Chat, you no. don't have to read a book if you've been paid for your contribution to it. No, you don't have to look at it again. Or you know all those actors who are in TV shows and never watch the shows. Uh, yeah. Okay, here's, John, look at the screen. John, look at the screen. Danny is responding. If I would come visit with him in Oregon. Yeah. He, I think he's referring to me being photographed by him if I moved, if I went oh, to Oregon. you go to Oregon, not me. I want to so, go too. Anyway, let's get back to porn. Yes. Um, <laughs> love you, Dan. Mark, I'm wondering if Mark can comment on his men. We have to do a whole chat about the, the men behind bars thing because he did so these shows. And we have actual, well, you can just watch the videotapes. I'm going to add, go back to the funny pictures. And we did Seth, Centaur. This is one of my favorite columns by you john from 2017 stocking stuff holiday homoerotica for your naughty list oh picture books and such yes yes quite quite the quite the festive array it was quite popular with our readers as i recall well, I, i'm very big into comics and cartooning i uh was the first editor to actually hire a cartoonist we had a weekly strip that ran for some time a, a plot so uh I got my hands on all these illustrated books. Actually, the Mark, Mark Abramson said he thanked us. Thank you. Aww. Thank you for tuning in. Actually, the artist on the upper right, I hired him to do the cover for a short story I did for the holidays last year that sold like maybe four copies on, on uh, Kindle. So, yay. No, he he's really talented. And here's another interview of Sorry Bad Scan. Uh, Cornelius interviewing Sean Duran. Very he used to be a real twink actually a long time ago, but he has evolved over the years. He certainly has. He gets you more more money and he gets you more sex. I can't believe I didn't go to the Knob Hill when he was performing. I mean, my God, who wouldn't want to lap dance with this guy? And this is my one of my other favorites. I just love it, love it, love it. I contacted Ooh. Jack Petra and said. Do you, I, I need an unusual photo of you, and he either already had this or he just had it taken um, by this photographer, but I love it because it's about gingers, it's about redheads, and he was one of the popular performers, and you did a great interview. I just love the graphics for that. This is when we had the luxury of three sections in the newspaper, arts, news, arts, and nightlife. They have since been absorbed the last two sections. Well, that all depends on the amount of advertisements one gets. Yeah. Well, yes. the paper's going to be. Yes, we were down to like 12 pages per week during the bad worst of the play. And there's Sean again with the other Sean, not to be confused. And you notice how the uh, escort ads have been shrunk down to a, a mere quarter page <laughs> because everyone's using Rentman. Well, you could go online and find a decent amount. In that doesn't help us. <laughs> no, in the within the BAR personals. Yes, yes, there's more there. Now, here's a this is a quality interview. Jesse Coulter is quite one of those smart guys in porn, right, Cornelius? Yes. Oh, yeah. There, are, you know, a lot of them are brilliant, and what it is is particularly with gay men. Um, the evolution of them exploring all sides of themselves to become their best selves. And a lot of gay men are self-created on every level. Mm. You know, a lot of, you know, like straight people just do what they've been acculturated to do, you know, get married, have kids, et cetera. Right. And the whole aspect of gay men being single and kind of the subtext of getting a good education to make money, to live the life you want to live outside of prejudice and, and you know, scorn. 
And so these people become these super people and their sexuality is a part of it. And it's also cultural. And as much as, you know, you perceive me as a porn star, as this icon in the community, as far as this representation of male sexuality. Mm. And then have the intelligence to go with it. The sensuality, yeah. the intelligence, the, the je ne sais quoi. But uh, the, this is a fascinating subculture. I did an article for Bartab about the number of kink.com gay feature videos that had been shot in gay bars. Pretty much all the bar owners were afraid to you know, even be quoted when it's really easy to find them and to know that they were shot in the bars. I mean, Paul was okay about me talking about truck and uh, the manager at the lookout was okay with that. Um, and you can see Van Darkholm on the lower left here in a picture. He was pretty much the guru behind uh, the, you know, the, the, the location-based porn features that Kink did uh, outside, of, outside of the castle, the armory. Genius. And he was yeah. a hot model. He was a hot model. Well, he got a oh, it, yeah, in the early days too. Yeah, definitely. But what I found so fascinating is the theatricality of this porn. They were they were so high end when pretty much everyone else was doing you know low budget home videos. There was a whole undercurrent of that beginning until they kind of had to stop because Kink moved and left town and all these other you know things happened. But Jesse Coulter was one of the main, uh, you could call lead actors, main characters in many of these videos with all kinds of. Well, not to my taste, but some fascinating knot work and rope work. Um, but the, my favorite quote, I'm going to try to read the right in the middle of the page is, what are some of the biggest misconceptions about kink and its, and its, and its fans? And his quote, Jesse says, that we're all crazy sex fiends who hurt each other. Kink is made up of some of the most wonderful, kind, and caring people. It's very safe and quite enjoyable. Well, that's a little facile, but uh, I think it says a lot. And oops, sorry, we missed one. Here's a nice guy. He was at the oh, Knob Hill. I love him. Dante? Yeah. He's you know, very he's short. short. He's short. Yes, yes. He he's he's what you call a pocket gay. Yes. That's right. <laughs> Pick him up. This was also promoting not not Knob Hill, but the, the local version of the Hustler Ball held at Dance House out in the way out in the avenues, or not in the avenues in uh, China Basin or whatever it's called now. Dog patch? I don't know. Anyway, he was performing in an orgy. Good for him. And this is another lovely, lovely column by John from 2018 about the, the romantic aspect of this series featuring one of my favorites, Ben Brown. Yeah, Ben. Can we, can we get Mark Abrams' face off the page? How Nothing. can you see his face? How are you? Why are you looking I, at his face? Can I you see, see him obscuring. Oh, I see. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to take him out of. Nothing the against face. Mark, but no. <laughs> I'm sorry. I That's all right, baby. You want to see the other stuff? You want to see the other stuff without Mark's face? There you go. Yeah. There's, yes, Ooh. There's a dildo. Oh, oh, you just passed up a good one. Yeah. No, we already saw this. I'm, I'll, I'll scroll back. We can that one. That one. And and here's I happened upon your final porn column, John. Good. From March 2018. I can't zoom in, but again, folks, you, you can easily look them up on issue.com and on the archives.com. You can look up and find the old articles on ebar.com. We have links on the upper right corner of all the old stuff. Who is that in black and white? Oh, it's an old physique. Yes. Or Bob Kedich doing an improbable bubble. I can't see it. I didn't, I didn't download it at high resolution, sorry. Uh, a later interview in 2018 with the incomparably friendly Adam Ramsey. Yeah. Cornelius nice is in I got snuck he, in a he, little. He, I have to go back and read this. I don't remember it. He has a he must have a background in theater arts or performing because he knows what he's doing in front of a camera. Yes. Adam Killian is the same way. And we, we'll talk about Adam more later. Oh, we will talk about Adam quite like now because this is your lovely article in the July 26th issue of the BAR about the sad closing of the Knob Hill Theater. Oh my God. If I'd have known, I'd have went there every day. <laughs> <laughs> I they, feel the same way about the Gaty in New York. I had friends who said, oh, I can get you a pass, Jake Corbin. And I was like, oh, I very, Those two gentlemen that owned it, Larry and Gary, love you, Larry, love you, Gary. They were extremely clever 
about everything they did and they made the most gracious exit. I was mm, devastated, right. but I understand. Yeah, there's Larry in the center on the upper left photo with two performers. There's the lovely, very talented Adam Killian uh, from a previous performance photo by Cornelius. That is one hot photograph. I love Thank it. You. I love it. Thank the you. Knee, the, the knee socks, the angle, the the taunting. And it, anyway, there's an old ad for Roger. Speaking of big talents, did you ever see him in person, John? Oh, Roger. Several, several times. Oh my goodness. How indiscreet can I be on this podcast? They're just words, honey. <laughs> I'm tooting my own horn here. I, you I'm should. Sure. I'm I'm sure sure you should. Yes. Roger. <laughs> if you was I able to get, that, if you was able to get your horn next to Roger, you did good. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, tell us about it. Let's see how far you go. Oh, you missed my comment. No, yeah, I missed it. Tell me again. I snorted coke with him. Oh, that's that's nothing we, to be. We were get, we were guests at a party that Wakefield Pool was hosting. Oh. Uh. And so there's a lot of coffee. Talk about. Oh, God bless you, Dan. God bless you. John Carr, how about a chapbook of your porn reviews done, Kurt? <laughs> Girls oh, they just, out. Yes. Oh, that's like, genius. Straight to hell. On the state to hell. Yes. Dan, that's very creative. <laughs> uh, I know the Grand gentleman Hall. that's the editor in chief of Straight to Hell. Do you want me to get you in touch with him? Boy McDonald's dead, but the new Straight to Hell. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, of course, of course. Yeah, definitely. John should be the next grand marshal of the parade. Thank you, Mark Klein. This is a good friend of mine. He's partial. Yes, he's also prolific in in with with Lavender Lounge. And he's a yes, he's a very he's with the sisters too, or was. Let's, he's he's very um, prolific and creative and supportive. That's the word I was I looking for. Seen most of all. In so long, Mark Klein. I'm looking forward to that. Dan Nicoletta says, "But Car and Jim are welcome. Let's make a porn film." Actually, if I can toot the horn, go ahead and talk about talk about snorting coke with Roger, John. That's the story. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. All right. All right. He was he was a dud. He was a dud. So um, a little a sidebar since we're talking about making porn films. If you want to know what I thought my life would like be like if I made a porn movie, my seventh novel, the fictional Finding Tulsa, is about a gay film director who laid in his, before, what, what's, uh, I, I fucked up the elevator pitch. Anyway, he makes a porn film at the end, just to, as overkill. I, I have a novel that could have been a very mainstream success, and so that was not, I just didn't want to do that, so I added five chapters of making a porn movie in the Phoenix Desert, because I kind of experienced that on a trip with some, and I turned it, the story around to where my narrator is the director. So thanks to all the guys who participated in the real version of that. But if you want to know why my interest in porn lies, it's basically that I threw it together in a novel that is worth every dollar. Thank you. Palm Drive Publishing, which also produces porn. That's why I chose I love Palm Drive Publishing. Somehow I, I can't see myself having sex with Jim. Maybe 30 years ago. Maybe yeah. a long time. I was pretty once. Really, I was. I was on yeah, the guest list. And I was on drugs. You were pretty and I was on drugs. <laughs> oh, we were all on drugs at the time. There were certain Not drugs. Me. Not me. I was so, so I want to show, them. let's see, let's look at some of the Knob Hill extras that I, oh, I don't think I can show that. Um, let's see. Quick look. I'm going to show off some of the Knob Hill closings since they were frequent advertiser and editorial topic. These are Underhill. That's Stephen Underhill photo. And I think... Yeah. Who that well, is? One of my favorite dancers. That's Gaetano. You'll see one of my images of him later. That's Gaetano. Oh, okay. And there's another favorite of Adam. Before yeah, that I did. Now that's yours, Cornelius, right? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And there's whoops. There's another one. There's another entertaining the crowd. And there's with the ex-boyfriend. Have you seen? Have you seen current pictures of Adam? On Twitter, he's only gotten better. Oh. oh. Is it, this is Race Cooper, right? Yeah, I think so. This is all, oops, naughty. That's Race. And <laughs> that is Adilson, one of my favorites. That's oh, sorry. me with Adam again. Love the lighting and Adam. Mm -hmm. And that's a vintage photo from a porn film that was shot at the Knob Hill. Oops, that's, an, that's the Grindhouse, the fabulous feature yes. film that um, 
features. You can have Sister Roma. Oh, there's Mr. Pam on the left. And there's they the invited me to that shooting, and I just couldn't bring myself to go. I probably would have broke down crying and never stopped. Oh, it was exciting. You should have come. Uh, epic, epic. Okay, so back to Roger. Three dimension with special glasses, three <laughs> D porn. Oh God, I would have, I would have loved to have witnessed that. So there were multiple theaters. The Bo Jest and Knob Hill, and then Los Angeles as well. So they had a, and there's more Roger in person at the Knob Hill. God. Oh, for a TARDIS. Oops, there's some more porn. Whoops, we can't show that. Uh, Whoa. <laughs> what? Oh, now we're screwed. Oh, dear. Sorry. I hear them coming to get you. I'm yeah. going to have to edit that out. <laughs> Poor Tyler Alexander. I think he left the business. Um, uh, porn, I'm very creative on my. Oh, Danny says he's very creative on his knees. <laughs> wow. So I'll probably have to un unupload this and edit out that moment just to avoid um, getting in trouble. Sorry about that. No more well, pictures. <laughs> do one of those, you know, put one of those black boxes over it that can make it look even longer than it is and lure it. Speaking oh. about speaking about longer than it is, let's get down to brass tacks here. Which yes. is the studio that I won't name, but it's Raging Stallion, who began the trend for uh, enlarging phalluses of their models in advertisements and box covers. Well, it wasn't Raging Stallion because they didn't have to, right? You would think that, but they did. Oh, well, just that's a little, just a little bit of gossip. I would. I would think that some of these guys wouldn't have to do that, but you know. Yeah, well, the guys, the guys wouldn't. It's the uh, people who turn it into product. Okay. So where are we now with adult entertainment? Can you pontificate on what you think should happen or what is happening that you think is good or bad or TikTok or New Tumble, all these, all these other old, new outlets? You want to go first, John? Because I have a lot to say. Okay, well, then I'll make a comment or two and maybe bounce off you later. But um, tic-tac porn, I'm all for OnlyFans, things like that. I think that porn performers should have more control over their product and the profits and how they want to represent themselves. Although I'm not insulting them by calling them whores, but they'll do anything because you're clicking that button and giving them money. <laughs> so, you know, but um, I think those are good trends. I, I I haven't seen much on TikTok, but they're so short that they're ineffective. Yeah, the whole like suddenly my clothes disappear thing. It's It feels like vaudeville. <laughs> well, that's yes. I, well, maybe that's why I like like that. It's fun. I it's think like porn, vaudeville on your iPhone. when porn can come out of the shadows of an epidemic, it will be, take the same forms it's always had. Which is I, which is. I'm Go ahead. staggered by the the diversity. It's 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 very bisexual. It's very bisexual. Oh bisexual. yes. It, yeah yeah yeah. I see these people like when this virus lifts, they all need to get agents because some of these guys are like art directing themselves within a nanosecond of perfection to jack off for people all over the world is the push of a button to make money. And they look amazing, you know, and you can see that they're straight in there, you know, just gay for pay and just doing what they're doing. And mm -hmm. when I recommend to my porn star friends that they do the same, that's this strange disconnect. And then the, the trends that I'm seeing in those genres of, you know, OnlyFans and things like that. It's just straight ma straight up masturbation, not a lot of sex. And, you know, all three of us have like theater backgrounds and costume backgrounds. Context, context, yes. I want yeah. firemen, don't take off the uniform. <laughs> right, right, lighting, 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 you know, you know, costumes, you know, music. Give them a glove, take something off. But yeah, you're like I was just discussing in our pre-interview uh, not to sound racist, but I, I really don't understand why a lot of this stuff that's going on on these film on, you know, these channels don't have any kind of decorative music. I mean, it's like 
you can hear crickets chirping, you know, and you hear people have like these little nickel 95 conversations with the people that's sponsoring them. But other than that, I'm like, where's the music? I mean, where's the movement? I mean, it, it's really strange. It's really well, strange. there's a difference between being a porn star and being a creative person. Uh, but the two can blend. And like they I can. Said, for and me, every once in a while, there's a very creative porn star. But by and large, they're not the creative sort, usually. They, and I think they, some of the things you just complained about, about their homemade porn, is what stamps it as real. I had a friend who, uh, a, a filmmaker who would say he liked models who had pimples because that was proof of their adolescence. He well, wanted to know, market people as young as he could. Yeah, and, and then the, the subtext of that is the viewer can kind of fantasize their way into it. But at the same time, if you can make something a little more art directed and idealized uh -huh. using the tools of idealization, to separate your brand from other people's brands and make even more money. Yeah. There's simple little things that you can do. And when I recommend it to my porn friends, my porn star friends, you know, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? What is it? Music rights unavailability. Yeah. No, 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 no. You, you can get them. They'll, they'll let you do it. They'll let oh. you do it. There's free music you can download. Long as you give them a credit, they'll let you do it. You know, they've done it with my films, you know, so uh, not that I do porn, don't. Let's not confuse people. Um, it's I've done some short films and used uh, people's music, free downloaded music, and all they ask is that you give them a credit. And I've done gay oriented stuff and gotten music from straight musicians. It's like, okay, I'm a gay artist. I'm doing this gay film. I'm using your music. You said it's free. All I got to do is give you a credit. I'll show you the film. And I've gotten great results from that. Oh, uh, yeah. In your yeah. movies, you always had to, when it came to the sex, you always had to use a stunt double. Oh, me? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, look, look. Let me help you. Let me do what you asked me to do. I don't know if you noticed it, but I'm naked on this right now. As we I've talk. noticed. Oh, God bless you. Well, you asked, I gave it to you. I'm just wearing a little bit of Obsession, baby. A little bit of Obsession Cologne by Calvin Klein. Oh, the smell of it. <laughs> people, now, people, now this is definitely one for the ages. We're gonna have people to always it. ask me why I write about porn. Well, it, it's a form of sex to me, writing about sex. So I kind of get off on it. But now I'm forgetting what I was going to say. Oh, um, it's one of my goals in life to see everybody on the planet naked with a heart on once. Oh, that's a great goal. Yes. Like well, to teach now you can see it because everybody's on OnlyFans and X video and Pornhub. Yeah. I'd like to see the bones around. Uh, anyway, yeah, it would definitely be that Pepsi commercial, but naked. Yeah, that would be fine. So I think Cornelius was saying something when I interrupted six times. <laughs> that's all right, baby. Because what I'm all I want to tell everybody that's in porn, that's doing this kind of work on X videos and Pornhub and that sort of thing, you know, throw a little bit of art direction on that, baby. You know, give us some of that dramatic lighting on those cheeks, you know, both sets. And uh, you know, kind of have a little bit of a set, you know. This what I have here wasn't expensive, you know, the lights and everything. It's not, it's not gonna break you. You'd be surprised what an O-ring can do for you, you know, and, and they're they're reasonable, they're reasonable. Everybody's got one now. Speaking of artistic, I'm going to cheat and go over to Cornelius's small array of his multiple photos. These are just a few of the images he sent me. This is Adam Killian. Yeah. Is this that Alex? Boldacek? Boldacek, yes. Oh, wow, yes. Very, no, I love that. Very George Terrell. With a pliers hanging off his tip. No, you I'm know what that is? Actually, it's gloves. He's mad for gloves. If you read the article I did on him, he's crazy about gloves. And so those gloves You're right. are black leather gloves, but they only have one finger, like the penguin in the Batman movie. <laughs> like a flipper with the one index finger. He fell in love with those gloves. No, I would not let him have the gloves. The hat is mine too. Next. Okay. And the tattoo in French, me libère pas. He it? told me and I've forgotten. Okay. Something about, I'm, I'm not free without something else, so. That's Gaetano, my favorite house dancer, the black one that I told you about before. That's Armani Exchange underwear. That's real cellulite film swirling around his loins 
and that's at the theater with the dramatic lighting. And that's my fa- one of my favorite images. I call it my version of the bat signal. <laughs> I said he used that for the cover of my seventh novel. Oh, well. Let me know. <laughs> that Special is Poppy, Poppy J. He's a Latino boy. He was like the last dancer they hired before they closed it. He was only there like maybe two months. He made a ton of money. That's my luchador mask and wrestler's robe. And I wanted to show the more melancholy side of the luchador culture. Oh, and it's okay. much, yeah, because you know how it's very colorful and they're very manic, but a lot of them have a lot of injuries and things. And so yeah. for the culture, they give their bodies up for their people. And then the bling on his uh, side of the mask, that's a little trick that I do in my camera. And it's one of my favorite images. Oh, yeah, because it does. It shows a different angle. Uh, to the Thank wrestling. you. Uh, that is Adil Sun Carlos, one of the house dancers, an actual model, real fashion model. Uh, I remember I shot him uh, for Milan Fashion Week. I did some images and he sent them in. That is my unicorn head. Target sold it that year during Halloween. <laughs> Target! Yes. The shoes are his. And, you know, just that moment before he went on stage, that moment. You go on stage always... with the unicorn head? Yeah, yeah. All right, get that furry fetish going on. <laughs> yeah, and he made tons of money. He made tons of money. That's that's maze balls. That is a house dancer by the name of Tattoo, fresh out of prison. He was the most joyful one and uh, bisexual, obviously. Hmm. Heavily tattooed, pierced nipples. Why do you yeah. say obviously? Obviously, in as much as the tattoos, the prison tattoos. The prison okay. tattoos. I see. Okay. Okay. And uh, this actually is Victor Belmont. And what I wanted to do was throw Victor in, in as much as what we were talking about, about the internet. At the time, he was the Rent Men's Man of the Month. Ooh. And the interesting thing about him, if you look at his nipples, you will see that he's actually a female to male transsexual. Right, right. And he was getting a lot of work and he had the most beautiful voice. And he reminded me of those very down to earth, esoteric, but very expensive yoga instructors that run around here in San Francisco. <laughs> you know, but the thing that moved me the most about him is most of those female to male transgenders, they have the most beautiful voices and they almost sound like they're speaking in stereo. It's very beautiful, lyrical. He was, he was very thankful I ran into him in the powerhouse. And was very approved. I said, "Hey, thanks for doing the interview." And he was like, "No, thank you." And you know, all this publicity because we had never—I don't remember ever seeing an FT uh, female to male transgender porn interview. And Victor had done several, but the paper had. So you broke another boundary there. We did mention uh, in our tech run, John, that you did review lesbian porn. I couldn't find—I didn't have time to find a screen. I, I did. I felt well. I had to get the women into the paper somehow. Um, so they I really, it. I really did look around and ask, ask people. So I interviewed one uh, gay woman, and and that was very nice. And then I found this other woman, uh, whose name, of course, I can't remember. She okay. made arty but still very erotic photos with people you wouldn't expect to be porn stars. Uh, she was very talented. So her and. I've lost touch with her and her her company's name, although I could find it again. But that was probably ten years ago, and she God knows where she, where she is now. But there was a there was a rise in cinema, erotic cinema, um, in the '90s, I, as I recall. The same when, time when new queer narrative non porn cinema was rising. That there was there yes. were studios that were producing bisexual, but mostly women on women to women erotic. Yeah. Movies. Carol Queen produced some uh, por- some female porn. Love you, Carol. A couple of other, yeah, a couple of other people did. Uh, one of the things that I've always was fascinated by is that uh, lesbians love gay porn too. Gay oh, they porn do. Also. They love it. They love <laughs> it. They eat it up. And I think yeah. what it is, it's men being more animalistic about it. You think? Yeah, and it's a curiosity. Like, they're not having sex with men. They're not really interested in men's bodies. But to see it abstracted into porn, 
in as much as, okay, these men aren't really like attracted to women, so I can disconnect around the threat. And then the animalistic aspect of it, where with women, it's other things going on. There is a romanticism, there is a sensuality, but with gay male porn, it's much more twos and fours, which is yeah. what sex is all about. That go, you have to do a sidebar and you explained earlier about twos and fours. I'm sure some of us understand. Okay, well, twos and fours is the countdown metaphor for sex. Uh, most sex is done to a two, four beat. And in the African-American community, back to the people not having music in their porn, uh, music sets the mood in the tone, hello. And so for the African-American community to always have that subtext playing, when we have sex, there's music playing. That's yeah. how you get your Luther Vandrosses, your Marvin Gaye's, your, you know, whoever that's the black male soul singer or your females, your Donna Summers, your Donna Rosses. And the interesting thing is we know that holistically, but the lead singer for Aerosmith, Stephen Tyler, yes, explained it to Oprah Winfrey. And he was right. talking about sex, you know, the twos and fours. And Oprah didn't know what he was saying. It's like twos and fours. He goes, that's, what, that's sex. It's, that's the sex. It's sex. And she was like, oh. And so it was kind of like subtextual, like you're not fucking. And if you're fucking and you're not fucking the music, you know, it's kind of like this whole subtext underneath it. But for Stephen Taylor, it kind of sound like Little Richard. Yeah. And yeah these yeah. things. Woo but to explain it to Oprah is, is just really funny. I was into Stravinsky as a teenager, so I was into 5'11", so that's why I didn't get laid until college. <laughs> anyway, so bump, bump, bump. That's, a, that's my Stravinsky joke. Yeah. What do you see? Um, I mean, we mentioned earlier about the future, the current state of porn. It seems to be it, it's it's just exploded and disintegrated in terms of studios, but they're still... They're still cranking those scenes out. Uh, what I found very oddly disturbing was, I mean, you know, I'm all for whatever, you know, get your boat up. But the scenes where the men are surreptitiously having sex in front of like at the bridal shower or the baby naming, the gender reveal party, um, getting caught seems to be the only thing they have left. Sex well, it's it basically only one studio that's doing it, men.com. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, they're horrid and repellent. Okay, because it's the whole derivative of the not in front of my salad moment. They realized they had a hit, and they seem to be consistently just trying to bank off that since then. There's a European company that does it too very well, and mm. uh, I've forgotten the name of it, but they do it very well also. There's a European one that does. It's called Sex in Public. I think it's called SexinPublic.com, maybe. And, well, that's um, like yeah, it's like they're on overpasses I, and stuff. I'm a like, misogynist. They are. They're so, really yes. So when I watch gay porn. I don't want any women in it. It's gay porn. Well, there's one where a woman actually, not actually, they dramatize a woman giving birth while the two guys are having sex like yeah. right next to her. It's it's like, really? Is that, who is getting turned on by this? Well, they, the, the filmmakers the think they're being daring. Yeah, okay. Exactly. There's always that subtext of them wanting to do it because gay sex is supposed to be verboten and forbidden. And so this whole sort of subtext of them doing it in public spaces where it may be uh, like culturally unacceptable, like this woman giving birth. Uh, there is one, one of my favorite ones, and they keep repeating it over and over, and it works every time, where the uh, husband and wife are moving, and one of the moving guys is gay. And so while the wife is back and forth and with the boxes, the husband and the moving guy are fucking, and then she interrupts it, like, where, what are you doing? Where are you going? Where's the moving guy? He goes over, oh, he's probably by the truck. Why don't you go out and see it? And the whole time while he's talking to the wife, the guy's ass fucking him. It, it, it's, you know, this whole sort of culture of gay, white, cisgendered men having this forbidden sex right. around women and calling themselves getting away and with it. A big part of these movies seems to be that the guys are discovered and the women are horrified. I watch a lot of bisexual porn, two men and one woman. And nobody's scan, you know, it's not a plot point. Whereas right. in, in the, the movies that men.com make, all are women discovering their friends or their lovers or their boyfriends or the waiter having sex. And they always pretend they're horrified. Well, big right, right. deal. Yeah, um, it's, the eroticization of trauma, I think, is my problem with yeah. this. You know, my basic problem is none of them can act. 
Well, it's, that. It's yeah. the funniest That's, trauma they're having. Parsley yeah. lid as well. You don't see it as a camp? You don't see the camp value? I see it, but that's not a turn on. That's ridiculous. Is that why you go to porn to see camp? You know, <laughs> be surprised. I camp, I'll watch like the stuff set in, you know, the, the Bow Chicka Bow Wow of the 70s. I'll, uh, the soundtrack is just so, you know, to watch an old cult video by a pool so song, that music, is, that's camp enough because yeah, it's retro. It's so, and it's so sexy. But it's, it's sexy, sexy because it's history. It's sexy because it was documented and those people are gone. Someone was commenting somewhere and said, oh, I can't watch porno if I know the, the actor's dead. And I go, well, that leaves a whole lot out for your right, you know, right. viewing pleasure. I have trouble watching porn of actors who it is revealed have prison records, three children, a wife they've been arrested for abusing. Right. Once I know too much about those guys, I don't care if they're gay for pay, as long as they give a good performance. Yeah. And when you start finding... Felony. Bad things yeah. about their personal life. I just don't watch them anymore. Yeah, as, whereas others may be completely turned, turned on. on by HB. Turned yeah, on. that's that's not one of the things that I learned while writing about in my in my eighth novel, Finding Tulsa, available now. Um, yes, indeed. Fictionalizing being on a porn set, I had to. I didn't have to do anything, but I wanted to humanize all the actors because it was kind of banal. Being on a porn set really like didn't turn me off of porn or sex. It just made it perfunctory, just like the music videos I I, I worked on in the '80s, just like anything else. Yeah, it's the business. But these home shot stuff, it, it it's strange in that they're so consciously now aware of the camera. There's a there's a, a kind of a shared voyeurism where where they they are the master, they're the owner, as you said before, they've taken control. But it's a very different genre. It's a very different look and feel when it's just, oh, here we are in a B&B in Palm Springs. There's no, there's no setting. There's no context. But at the same time, it's like you said, they've, they've self-empowered. They've self-monetized. So good for them. So that's sexy. Is seeing guys who are like, hey, let's just have sex. There's no narrative. There's no music. There's no, it's just us having sex and we're all on prep. So yay. But what I didn't understand was how the hell they were all having sex during a pandemic. Well, you know, uh, a friend of mine that we did an article on about uh, the history of the BAR1 ads. The yeah. porn star's name is Jared Erickson. Love you, Jared. He and I have discussions about exactly what you just said. And what he's telling me is that they all make sure that they are completely healthy. They okay. all make sure. They're all kind of friends. They all have each other's phone numbers and email addresses. They all, yeah, 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 and they get huh. together. They have their own little hub. Okay. Exactly, exactly, and that's how Jared tells me that he does it. He lives in Atlanta, like right outside of Atlanta, and they're just now starting to open up the bars and things. And so, and he's telling me that's how they do it. So yeah. I'll tell. I have to tell you two things, um, because I want them on the historic record. So researchers in the future, because I'm not going to write a tome. Did we already talk about Chuck Holmes and who he would or would not cast in his films? Oh, please, please yeah. explain that. I think we did that earlier in the day. In no. the pre-interview, yeah. Okay, well, he would not hire for many years. This has changed now. Of course, he's been gone for some time. He would not put in his films scenes with tattooed people, people who were redheaded, and people who were African-American. His loss. He said, he said it was, it's too hard to light redheads. You can't light them. You can't, well, that's not right. And he just didn't like tattoos. He thought it marred the body. And many people do think that. Mm -hmm. um, Still do. As, for, as for blacks, well. Well, you, you know, if you can't handle black sexuality, then don't shoot it. I would rather you not shoot it than for you to make a half-assed attempt and then black people feel like, what the fuck? You didn't yeah. know what you were doing. And he's not making it for black people. He's making it no. for the white um, fetish. Male right. Mm -hmm. huh. And that's, that's going to be the new, in the 21st century, that's going to have to be the, the major discussion around porn, the uh -huh. diversity of it, the whole spectrum of it. And that's what the Bay Area Reporter has always been about. Like one of yeah. the articles I'm working on with Jim is this a uh, documentary about black men in gay porn, how they're being accepted or not accepted, how they're being cast, not cast. Mm 
And it's going to be an exciting article, John. I can't wait for you to read it. So, <laughs> so I uh, was very friendly with another studio owner who used black men in his casts fairly frequently, but not always. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, it depends on who's buying the stuff because it, it might be very progressive of you, to, you know, to film people with hair lips or no, uh, or, you know, whatever. It's got to sell. But if it's not going to sell, he's not going to make it. Well, that's, so, that's going to be kind of like the subtext of the article that I'm writing is that um, just a little, little taste. You have to be aware of your market and then yes. know what you can do within that market that works for you that keeps your conscience clear as a black male performer. I've uh -huh. been asked to do porn and I'm like, that would confuse so many people mm -hmm. because the way I present myself and the way that I want people to see me as a sexual being is gonna cause such a disconnect mm -hmm. because the way we see black men, particularly black gay men, and the way we see them and the way we want to be presented and the way right. we want to express ourselves as far as marketing and advertising, there's work to be done, a lot of work. Oh boy, yes. And the other- I, I, I can't wait to get into it to help people with it. The right. other point was, um, I've been on many shoots, porn shoots, although not for 15 years now. So uh, this bit of information may be out of date, but as two or three performers came out of the men's room with erections, the publicist for the company bent over and said to me, uh, we don't mention caverjacking. Mention and I knew what? he was telling me, he was telling me that I could not uh, write about it in my articles. It was an unspoken thing. Many performers said it, it's a shot in your penis. It gives you a four hour heart on. I was always curious as to whether it, what? And you just take a pill, right? I think uh, Caverjack was more effective, and I think pills were not as available at the time. Oh, okay, all right, wow. I knew some go-go yeah. boys that did it. Yeah. Just get a rubber band. Cock ring. <laughs> Cock ring. Oh, well, that's a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff that we, we're, we're, we have one minute yet to go uh, for our 90-minute program, but we can certainly talk more offline, and you're all welcome to offer your comments in the comments section on our, as this is archived later on our YouTube channel and on the Facebook page. Thank you both, John and Cornelius, for a sexy, fun, open, honest, and in incisive discussion about the history of gay porn sexuality as covered by the Bay Area Reporter and elsewhere. One, one more, one more. John has an epilogue. Come the BAR on. has a history of porn review before me. I did not create the field. Don McLean wrote some porn reviews. He was better known as a drag queen named, eh, I don't remember. And he was on uh, All in the Family. Yes, he was on All in the Family. Why, the TV show? And there, and there was somebody else, somebody else who wrote an actual review of a porn review before me. So I didn't, I didn't create the field, Right. certainly. Right. But you certainly were the, one of the more prolific uh, in the field. Yeah. You oh, yeah. Hanson extended it. <laughs> well, thank you both thank again. You. And uh, yeah, thank look up those old me. ERs and uh, your comments. And, and Ori uh, Shannon, Mark Abram, Mark right. Abram, Mark Abram says that's who it was. Lori Shannon, who was also in. Let me show that so we can all remember that. Google Lori Shannon. We also have an article about Lori Shannon and John McClain in one of the uh, uh, historic articles in the on the website ebar.com look for the paper coming out subscribe to our youtube channel if you like as well thank you everyone for sharing and uh, i'm going to edit out that wiener pick of tyler alexander as soon put as a brick over it come on <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Elephant face, elephant black boxes are so black boxes are so sexy <laughs> <laughs>